Hey y'all, welcome back to my show, Bourbon and Bones. So it's our third episode and we're very excited. Um, as you can tell, we've done a little bit of updating to our set. So here at Bourbon and Bones, we're always trying to improve. Um, the last two videos looked really great on my, on my computer. Um, looked a little rough on the phone, so hopefully we have fixed that. So what do you think? Tell me uh, in the descriptions below. What do you think of the new set? Um, and if this is your first time visiting us here, um, thank you for coming. We're excited to have you. Um, if you like what we're doing, uh, comment, share, and like below. So, um, last week we did, um, we dove into the history of Buffalo Trace um, and their flagship bourbon there. And this week we're going to jump into a little bit more history again. Um, well, history, a little politics, nothing modern, I promise. Um, intrigue, theft, deception, um, it's a very, uh, it's gonna be very fun, it's gonna be a very interesting episode, so we're excited about that. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dig into the bourbon. So we're gonna start this evening with our very first wheated bourbon. So these are commonly called weeders. Um, so this is Larceny, so absolutely one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite bourbons. I, I, I just, I think it's a wonderful one. I love weeded bourbons. I think that they're um, very complex, but you really have to dig through a few glasses or a few sips of it first to really find all the notes. Um, high rise are great. I love a good high rise as well, but they just kind of assault you with flavor first. So you never think to dig past them to get a little bit more. Um, I think weeders and low rise are both, uh, you've really got to chew through them, and it's a bit of an exploration. Um, and Larceny, I think, is one of the most readily available, and um, I'll say it, probably one of the best uh, weeded bourbons on the market that isn't um, hundred something dollars. So, I mean, around under 30 bucks, this is definitely going to be an incredible bourbon for you. Um, so, as we know about bourbon, bourbon must be a minimum of 51% corn. Um, and the second portion of the mash, in this case, is wheat as opposed to rye. And 2 to 4% malted barley. Um, so, Larceny is actually a blended bourbon, like most bourbons nowadays. And it's blended with itself, and it's blended within a variety of years. So, it's a, and so, bur so Larceny tends to be a 6 to a 12-year-old blended together. So this is a pretty uh, complex and has a lot of depth to it. If you get it like a 12 year old bourbon, you're really getting some great age on it. So looking at the bottle itself, um, on here twice is the name John E. Fitzgerald. <clears throat> um, we're going to answer to why in a second. Um, established in 1870, it's a 92 proof, it's a very special small bag which means it really is actually only about 100 barrels are blended to make Larceny. So it's a very small batch. To give you an idea, something like a Maker's Mark could have thousands of barrels because it's not a small batch bourbon, it's a large batch. Just to show you the, the difference. Um, <clears throat> and when you, on our close-up here, you'll be able to see uh, the key is actually in the keyhole and that plays a big role into the story. So let's go ahead and jump into a little bit of history. So John E. Fitzgerald, he was not a master distiller, and he did not own a distillery. He was a bond treasury agent. So he worked at a distillery, and as a bond treasury agent, he held all of the keys. He was the only person who had the keys to all the rick houses. Um, this is actually due, going back a little bit politically, um, to Alexander Hamilton. So he introduced the whiskey tax of 1790 and the subsequent whiskey rebellion ensued. And we'll definitely get into that later because the whiskey rebellion is a you know, fun part of history and we'll pair that off of the Great Bone Wars about 100 years later um, in a different episode. And I'm, I'm very excited about that one. I think you'll really like it. Um, but anyway, so after the whiskey rebellion, uh, bond agents were assigned to every single distillery. And so they actually lived on site, they held all the keys, um, and 
that was it. They were the only ones that had it. <clears throat> and they actually lived on the premises. So, because Mr. Fitzgerald was the only person with the keys, and having a superior taste uh, for fine bourbon, he would often slip into the rick houses at night, and he would relieve some of the best uh, barrels of bourbon of their contents. And in fact, uh, the industry, um, when they find a barrel that's a little too light, um, they would often call it a Fitzgerald barrel. So the story of the man became so well known in Kentucky, um, not just for his nice, nightly heists, but also his superior palate, that S.C. Herbst named his distillery after him. Um, so in, 17, in 1870, um, Old Fitzgerald Distillery opened and started producing bourbon by the same name. Um, and the name still carries on, as many of you know, uh, thanks to a Pappy Van Winkle, uh, also a, a very uh, sought after bourbon and also, by chance, a weeder. So, um, and he kept the brand alive, um, and now, after uh, 2012, Heaven Hill came out with Larceny. So, let's go ahead and get into our tasting. So, uh, as always, we start the evening with, um, with it neat. Um, nice dark color, give it a nice swirl, wake up the bourbon. You get salted caramel and banana nut bread, I think. And a little bit of um, floweriness. I mean, it, it's, this is what I love about weeded bourbon. It doesn't have any rye. So any kind of spice you smell or taste has to come from the barrel itself, from the charring. But you get a lot of com different complexity from weeded bourbons. And right away you get pepper, and a little bit, actually the cinnamon that I'm tasting right now is actually, um, it's on the palate, it's actually, um, when you have a cinnamon cookie and it dries out your palate for just a second, that's what you get. And uh, some nice long oaky tannins from it. Yeah, but there's vanilla and a little bit of pepper and just a, a hint of caramel. But it's it's so it's all so delicate and uh, balances so well. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Definitely pick up a bottle of this and, and explore through it neat. So we're gonna, I, like always, we're going to take a quick little break and we're going to jump back in with a little bit of water and kind of see how things have changed. Welcome back. It's been uh, 10 minutes in the YouTube world. Um, and we're going to jump in with... Uh, Larceny again, but with a little bit of water this time. So, um, as some of you have noticed and have been watching from the beginning, we met uh, one of my dogs, Zuko, earlier, and now you're getting to see a few of the spring animals that come along with Arizona. So we have mayflies and regular flies, occasionally scorpions, and so if you see a scorpion, please tell me immediately because those things are terrifying. Um, so occasionally you might see a fly in the shot. I'm so sorry. Um, it's spring and I do the best I can. <laughs> I would kill them all if I could. Um, but with that aside, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the tasting notes of Larceny with a little bit of water. So now you can actually smell a bit of the pepper. Which is different because we didn't smell any of the spices before. I 
I'm still getting that toasted bread and a little bit of banana. Um, a little nutty, some like banana nut bread. So it's just a little on that nutty side. Um, and most of it has got to be coming from, the spices are definitely coming from the barrel, um, but the nuttiness and the weedy toastiness is coming from the wheat. So with just a little bit of water, the pepperiness just falls away. Um, not in a bad way, it's just far less noticeable. Um, you still get a nice little light cinnamon, and there's actually a lot less uh, tannin, oaky, drying on the palate afterwards. Um, I think a splash of water makes this more um, quick sippable, or... Um, easier to introduce someone into bourbon. It would just a splash of water in there kind of pulls back some of the um, unfamiliar notes. Um, but I, I think I might prefer this neat. So I think this is one that I feel has a lot more complexity and a lot cleaner of a finish uh, with it neat. So. That's a first. That's exciting. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, try them both. Try them both ways. Tell me what you think in the comments below. What do you think of Weeders? What do you think of uh, Larceny itself? What do you think of with water, without water? You know, um, let me hear what you think. Um, I'll be live for the time that this uh, debuts, so let's... Uh, Let's dive into the comments section. So, as we transition now from the bourbon to the bones part of bourbon and bones, we're gonna put the larceny away for a little bit. And last week we talked about a specimen that was billions of years old. Um, and this week we're gonna talk about um, a specimen that swam through the oceans um, in the my early Miocene and Pliocene period. So that was 23 to 3.6 million years ago. And that was Car Caracles Megalodon. And this was a massive hunter. Currently, it's uh, related to sharks, uh, related to the great white, but was not a great white, whether the predecessor is a close related cousin. Important to know. But Megalodon weighed 55 tons. It was about 60 feet long, so it was longer than a city bus. Its teeth averaged six and a half inches long. My tooth here was actually a growing tooth, a possible juvenile growing tooth or a young adult growing tooth, um, but a full-grown adult would have the bite force of approximately 25,000 to 40,000 pounds per foot. So Megalodon was huge. And here's a picture of a scientist holding the jaws of a great white inside the jaws of a Megalodon to show some scale perspective. So Meg Megalodon could conceptually swallow a great white whole without even worrying about it. So let me go ahead and say this. Um, as much as I hate it, Megalodon is extinct. Um, it cannot be living in the deep oceans. There's not enough down there for it to eat. Um, it ate seals and whales and giant turtles and large fish. And by, like giant turtles, I mean like golf cart sized turtles. So um, nothing down in the deep oceans is large enough for it to, to, for it to live on. Um, it, it would be near the surface. It was a surface hunter. It was a blitz attacker. It would, uh, would come up and hit um, hard and fast, and then the animal would start to die, and he would slowly eat on it from there. So, I mean, it would be very clear that we, that it was still alive. So, um, it doesn't change the fact that this is an absolutely amazing specimen. So, my tooth here, um, is actually, so this lighter section, as you can see in the picture, is enamel. So, that's the fossilized enamel. Uh, you can see a little bit of the gum line on the tooth. It's a little bit rougher section. 
And this, uh, from my research, indicates that this was a growth tooth. So this was a tooth on a shark's jaw that was slowly turning its way up. So it's growing as it shifts. So as a, a shark loses a tooth here, this moves forward, moves another one, moves forward again. So they're perpetually growing teeth. So that is my Megalodon specimen. Um, I love Megalodon. I think it's one of the coolest uh, cousins to sharks, and we can call them sharks for lack of a better term, because, uh, I mean, they were incredible. I mean, it was the largest swimming brute force killing machine that ever, that ever existed. Um, they were amazing. Um, so, again, we wrap up this evening uh, with a, an amazing specimen, um, an equally amazing bourbon, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. If this is your first visit and you like what you saw here and you made it to this point, um, go ahead and, and like and subscribe us. Um, share what we're doing here. We're really excited to have you. Um, if you're uh, an old hat to the channel at the third episode, uh, like and share us. Um, and thank you for returning. So for Bourbon and Bones, thank you. And don't forget, share a bourbon with somebody.